Hello and welcome to episode 36, Remastered. Today, I'll be wrapping up my series on the diversity of life by exploring the outer edges of life itself. Today, I'm going to talk about the things that aren't quite life, but aren't exactly non-life either. Things that have some, but not all, of the fundamental qualities found in all other living things. I'm talking about viruses, which can also be called viral particles, because they're much more like particles of complex biomolecules than any kind of large, organized, living cell. It's not definitively known where or how viruses came into being. There's a lot of theories, but none that are conclusively validated by the evidence. One of the major theories is that viruses are the remnants of some ancient bacteria that lived inside a eukaryotic cell. Some of these ancient bacteria would include the ancestors of the mitochondria and the chloroplasts, both of which lost various organelles over time as their purpose within the, the larger eukaryotic cell became more specialized. The general idea is that this also happened for viruses. But where mitochondria became specialized for producing ATP, and they generally lost all of the organelles and whatnot that weren't required for that process, and chloroplasts became specialized for conducting photosynthesis, viruses became specialized at parasitism, at infection. They lost much more than a few organelles during their evolutionary origin. They lost all their organelles, but they also lost their cytoplasm and almost anything that resembles a traditional bacterial cell, with the exception of a handful of protein residue and maybe a plasma membrane coating. There's some pretty decent evidence for this theory, too, including the genome of the largest known virus, which has residual genetic sequences that code for proteins that are only seen in cells. They're like genetic artifacts of a cellular past. Another major theory is that viruses emerged not as a simplification of life, but as a small-scale increase in sophistication of biomolecules. There are genetic structures known as plasmids and transposable elements, which are basically small chunks of free-floating DNA that encode one or more proteins. In bacteria, these plasmids are used to transmit genetic information between individuals. And in eukaryotes, transposable elements are used in a dynamic form of gene expression. These free-floating gene clusters, called plasmids or transposable elements, are able to replicate themselves, which makes them another example of pseudo-life, or things that exist on the edge of life. It's hypothesized that these free-floating genetic particles are flakes or chunks that broke off the genome of some more complex organism. These chunks of genes, these gene clusters, contained enough information to encode for a few proteins. When these genes are expressed, their proteins would cluster around the DNA like a primitive capsid. This step up from biomolecules to a replicating biomolecular complex would have subjected these early viral ancestors to a chemical evolution, shaping their genes and their bodies as if they were the tiniest organisms. But they're not organisms. Not quite. There's a third theory about the origin of viruses, and it's a newer theory which posits that the viruses are the descendants of some of the first life on Earth. The theory takes support from the RNA world hypothesis, which itself argues that life on Earth began as the more rudimentary and unstable RNA, which would later evolve into DNA. This implies several things about the nature of life and the origin of life, namely that there was first an RNA gene pool before there was a DNA gene pool. This hypothesis is supported by the fact that viruses have a number of genes that code for proteins that haven't been seen in any kind of cell. These are proteins and their associated gene sequences that are entirely unique to viruses, which implies that they originated from an earlier gene pool, a separate gene pool, one that originated first, and from which the DNA gene pool diverged. This basically means an evolutionary divergence that happened so long ago 
that life had barely even ascended from biomolecules to actual cells. Although this is strong evidence in favor of the RNA world hypothesis, and this particular hypothesis over the origin of viruses, the issue is far from settled. The origin of viruses is shrouded in mystery. They seem to be ubiquitous. They seem to be an ever-present aspect of life, and yet we just haven't figured out how they first appeared. Despite this, viruses have been extensively studied and organized based on their genetics, their outward appearance or their phenotype, the host that they infect, and the nature of the diseases that emerge from, uh, from their infection. This process of classification is called the Baltimore classification, after its creator, David Baltimore. The original criteria in the Baltimore classification was how the virus produced mRNA for the intermediate step in gene expression. Using just this criterion, viruses have been organized into seven major groups, or classes, numbered 1 through 7. It's pretty convenient. Three of these classes have DNA, and four of them have RNA. The viruses that possess DNA include the adenovirus, herpes, pox viruses, parvoviruses, hepadenoviruses, and many others. Those viruses with RNA include the retroviruses, the picornaviruses, the togaviruses, the rhabdoviruses, the orthomyxoviruses, and more. Now, the Baltimore classification has been modified in recent times, with more specific criteria added on um, in addition to the one that I mentioned a moment ago. With all of these criteria taken into account, from the genotype and the phenotype to the host and nature of the infectious disease, biologists have been able to taxonomically group viruses into 70 families, each family containing several genuses and numerous species. Despite these classifications and all that we know about them, viruses remain a cryptic biological puzzle with many unanswered questions. Viruses are strange and enigmatic things. They're pathogens composed of a small handful of biomolecules organized into a simple structure, like a column or a polyhedron. When compared to cells, viruses are extremely small and very simple because they lack the sophistication and the complexity to really be considered their own self-sufficient organisms. While viruses are without a doubt an animated structure composed of organic molecules, they aren't considered to be truly alive because they don't have cells. They're not composed of a cell. They're too small to be made of cells. And what they are isn't really even close to a cell in the first place. Second, even though they have DNA, they lack almost all of the biochemical machinery necessary to sustain life like enzymes for reproduction, or enzymes for chemical digestion. They don't have any of this. Because viruses lack all of these things, they can't make their own ATP, or their own nucleotides, to repair their DNA. In order to get the raw chemical building blocks to replicate themselves, viruses must invade a host cell and seize control of its enzymes and ATP. The virus hijacks the host cell and uses its biochemical machinery to make the energy and proteins and nucleotides that it needs to sustain itself. The virus also takes over the reproductive machinery of the cell and uses it instead to create more viruses. The viruses accumulate within the host cell until it explodes, which sends out a bursting cloud of new viral particles in all directions so that they can infect more cells. A viral infection is essentially your body's cells being hijacked by generation after generation of viral particles, which reproduce in pulsing waves of cellular destruction. As far as illnesses go, some viral infections are relatively mild, or easy to treat or cure, while other viruses are extremely dangerous and often fatal, like Ebola, West Nile, HIV, and rabies. Where bacterial cells are many times smaller than your average eukaryotic cell, viral particles, or individual viruses, are many times smaller than bacteria. They're so small 
mainly because the virus is quite literally just a few biomolecules arranged in an organized complex. All viruses have a primary body that's composed of a sheet, or a coat, of proteins, called a capsid. The capsid is like a capsule, or a container, which holds the virus's genetic material. Some viruses, like smallpox among many others, have both a capsid and an outer membrane that's studded with more proteins. These are called enveloped viruses, because they're literally contained within a plasma envelope, while viruses that just have the bare capsid, just the raw protein coat, are called naked viruses. Some of these viral capsids are composed of a string of proteins that spiral into a long, thin tube shape. Other kinds of capsids are shaped like a polyhedron, such as the icosahedral capsid of the adenovirus, or the globular shape of a bacteriophage. Some of the capsids within a plasma envelope are little more than squished sacs composed of proteins, like a sock that's been stuffed inside another sock. In the case of some bacteriophages, their globular protein capsids are connected to a shorter tube, and at the end of the tube protrude a number of simple, stalk-like appendages used to latch onto a host cell's outer membrane. Within every virus's capsid exists some quantity of genetic material. Viruses have a particularly wide variety in their DNA, with some using DNA and some even using RNA. Of the viruses that possess DNA, some use double-stranded DNA, while others just use a single strand of DNA. There's a lot of variety. And of those that possess RNA, some of them also have double-stranded RNA, while others use single-stranded RNA, which is the more traditional format for it, because double-stranded RNA tends to be a little unstable. Okay, so this is all pretty simple so far, but it starts to get more complicated when we look closer at the viruses that have single-stranded RNA. This particular subset of viruses can be divided further into three groups. So of the single-stranded RNA viruses, you have positive sense, negative sense, and ambisense. All right, try to recall the details of transcription and translation, which I covered in episode 15. In order for the gene to be expressed as a protein, it must first be transcribed from DNA into mRNA which is then translated and used in the construction of the protein. The positive sense RNA viruses have genetic material with codon sequences that are identical to the mRNA required to create the protein. The negative sense viruses have genetic material with complementary codon sequences, not identical sequences. The ambisense RNA viruses have two regions of their RNA genome, one that's complementary to the mRNA and one that's identical. So the viruses in this third group have both qualities. They have a, a selective advantage in that sense. During the infection of a host cell, the viral genetic material will be expelled into the host cell, where it will then hijack the host cellular machinery, its enzymes, and its nutrients, so as to produce the proteins that the virus wants to produce. This infection process can be broken down into six basic steps, or stages. The first step involves the virus attaching to the host cell and entering the cytosol, entering the interior guts of the host cell, where the cell is the most vulnerable. Once inside, the virus begins the second stage by expressing its genes into viral proteins, using the cellular machinery of the host cell. In the third stage, the virus replicates its genome, which leads to the fourth stage, where the replicated genome is inserted into the newly created bodies of replicated viral capsids. In the fifth stage, the virus has replicated itself many times, and so the cell is full of viral particles. The cell will attempt to defend itself by perhaps trying to expel the viral particles and spit them out, but there's still a lot within it, so it's, it's kind of a losing battle. And if the viral particles apply such a pressure to the cell, they can cause rips and tears in the membrane and leak out. And in other cases, they can explode and blast everywhere and come into contact with other nearby cells. 
The sixth stage involves these new viruses searching for and landing on a new host, where the process will begin all the way back at stage one as they begin the infection process all over again. This is also how the viral particle will spread throughout an organism's tissues, throughout its body. All right, so let's look at the process in more detail. The first stage involves the virus getting past the host cell's defenses. So how do they do it? How do these little parasitic packets of DNA invade the cell of its host? And how do these viruses infect the cells? How do they get the cells to do what they want? This ability is a fundamental aspect of the virus's life cycle, and it's the reason we have viral epidemics and plagues that cause widespread misery and death. So on a molecular level, attaching to and getting into a host cell can be challenging, and a huge part of the variety of viruses and why some viruses can infect you while others can't has to do with their strategies for breaching the host cell. Plant cells, for example, have cell walls, and plant viruses have to find a way to get through this dense cell wall to infect and exploit the cell itself. In many cases, the virus has found it easiest to simply wait on the mouthparts of an insect. The insect will eventually go find a plant to eat, and as the insect chews, scrapes, and sucks at the plant tissue, the virus is able to infect the plant cells by exploiting these massive holes and abrasions in their damaged cell walls. The virus basically exploits the insect as a giant wrecking ball. And then, once they're in the plant tissue itself, these plant viruses will excrete lysozyme enzymes that burn little holes in the plasma membrane of the plant cells. Viruses that infect bacteria are called bacteriophages, and they too have to find a way to get past a cell wall. Bacteria are coated in a cell wall, like gram-positive bacteria that have a thicker cell wall that's primarily composed of peptidoglycan. But because bacteria are so small, they aren't really vulnerable to having their cell walls torn open by insect chewing, like plant cells are. Bacteriophages have to find some other way to get past the cell wall, and this usually involves them finding a way to bind to the cell wall and either dig through it themselves or secrete some kind of caustic chemical that'll burn its way through. The bacteriophage has to do the work itself, and some of the tactics that they've evolved are pretty gnarly. Some of them use their tail fibers like a shovel to scrape and dig a hole in the membrane. Other bacteriophages use an appendage like a needle to stab into and puncture the bacterial membrane. This needle appendage is like a syringe, because the virus uses it to inject its genetic material into the cell. The viruses that infect animal cells don't have to deal with the cell wall, because animal cells don't have cell walls. But animal viruses do have to deal with a sophisticated animal immune system, with multiple layers of physical, chemical, and genetic defenses. The viruses must first bind with a chemical on the cell's surface, which usually tends to be some kind of biomolecule with a sugar residue bound to it, like a glycolipid or a glycoprotein. After interacting with this molecule on the cell's outer surface, the cell will respond in such a way to cause it to ingest the virus, or to bring the virus into itself. In most cases, this is done through endocytosis, which is a normal process wherein the cell will ingest something by enclosing it in a little membrane bubble that it pulls into itself, called an endosome, which buds off of the membrane inside the cell. This endosome is like a tiny little chemical stomach. It's lined with associated enzymes, and these will pump out chemicals that turn the inside of the endosome into a bath of acid. The acidic conditions typically decay and destroy almost anything the cell ingests, but not so for viruses. Shaped by evolution, the virus actually has proteins that will activate and work more efficiently in these higher acidity environments. So the cell has been tricked with a false signal to bring the virus into its body, into its cytoplasm. And when it realizes that there's a virus in there, it'll try to digest the virus by flooding it with acid. But this will actually activate the virus and initiate a process where the virus's membrane will merge with the endosome's membrane. 
By merging, the virus can release its genetic material from its membrane, outside of the endosome. It can break out of its prison, so to speak, and release its genetic material into the cytosol, into the interior of this now-infected cell. If this process seems a little abstract, consider this metaphor for the interaction. The virus is like a secret agent who specializes in instigating rebellions in enemy countries. This secret agent deliberately gets noticed by hostile authorities, and is immediately taken into custody. But inside the prison, the secret agent will begin to do his work, by radicalizing the prisoners to turn against the guards in a violent revolt. The prisoners will break out of the prison, and the secret agent will get away and will be able to do it again at another prison. This is like how the virus will alert the cell to its presence, get ingested through endocytosis, and then fuse with the endosome to escape and put its genes into the cytosol, where it takes over and eventually kills its host, before spreading on to infect more cells. While a lot of viruses use this technique of violently hijacking an endosome, other viruses, like HIV, have a more sophisticated approach. HIV interacts with two different molecules on the cell surface, and this allows it to stabilize itself in such a way that it can merge its viral membrane directly with its host cell's outer plasma membrane. As the membrane coating the capsid merges with the cell's membrane, the capsid is pushed all the way through into the cell, like a person going through a stargate to step onto an entirely new planet. The capsid decays and breaks apart, which reveals the virus's genetic material, which will then go on to infect the cell. Okay, so now in the process, the virus has completed step one. It's bound itself somehow to the cell wall or the membrane, and it's done something to bypass these obstacles and get its DNA, or its RNA, into the host cell itself. Now what? Instead of identifying the viral genetic material as foreign, the host cell can mistake it for safe DNA and begin to express it. Some viruses have plasma membranes, and just like plant and animal membranes, it has specific membrane-bound proteins embedded within it. The virus DNA that codes for these membrane proteins goes through the host cell's system as if it was the cell's own membrane proteins. The proteins in the virus capsid itself are typically expressed by free-floating cytosolic ribosomes. In the case of viruses with plasma membranes, these capsids migrate towards the cell's membrane, and they merge through a patch of viral membrane proteins that have been expressed earlier. This forms a bubble of a membrane, studded with viral proteins, that wraps around the viral capsid and creates a new virus. But viruses aren't just proteins with the occasional membrane. They also have genetic material, like DNA, or some kind of negative sense, positive sense, or ambisense RNA. How does this get copied? Making new genetic material is a lot more difficult than making proteins. For one, the process is much more tightly regulated. Viruses with DNA are able to use enzymes that are already present within the host cell to print out more DNA. But viruses with RNA aren't so lucky, so they had to evolve various means of replicating besides simply hijacking the cell's own enzymes. They had to find some way to make their own. Some viruses use proteins called RNA replicases, which use the host cell nucleotides to build a complementary strand of RNA. This complementary strand is then used as a template to build more of the original viral RNA. There's other kinds of viruses called retroviruses, and these use a different technique. They have an enzyme called a reverse transcriptase that can make a complementary strand of DNA from its original RNA. This is like the opposite of traditional eukaryotic DNA replication, which involves the information in the DNA being transcribed temporarily into RNA and then back into DNA. In these viruses, however, the RNA gets transcribed into DNA, which exploits the host cell's enzymes to turn it back into RNA. Once all the proteins and genetic material has been constructed, they assemble into new viruses. They assemble into new viral complexes, new viral particles. This assembly process is not well understood. Various species of virus have their replicated clones assembled on the cell membrane or in the cytosol, or on the membrane of an organelle, 
there's a lot of variety here. Some of them build the capsid first, and then put the genetic material inside of it, while others build the capsid around the genetic material directly. The details of all of these processes really aren't very well understood. They're so poorly understood that we don't really have any pharmaceutical drugs that inhibit the assembly portion of a virus's life cycle. And that's kind of mind-blowing when you think about it. The host cell, having had its internal machinery and its enzymes literally hijacked by the virus, will print out more and more of these constituent parts of its infector, usually until it dies. Those viruses that have a plasma membrane coating are able to simply merge with the host cell's membrane and butt off from the outside, departing the original host cell in search of another one to infect. This process is relatively clean and graceful compared to what the uncoated viruses will do. The uncoated viruses, or those viruses whose protein capsid is not encoded in a plasma membrane, will be replicated inside the host cell until they fill it up and the pressure causes the host cell to explode. Quite literally, these viruses will force the host cell to continue replicating them until the cell has no more available space and the internal pressure causes it to lice or explode or collapse or otherwise suffer a catastrophic structural failure that spills the new viral particles outwards into the local environment. This is how viruses spread throughout your body, as they can infect cells near your bloodstream and spill new viral particles directly into your circulatory system. Viruses can propagate by spreading throughout a body, but they thrive by spreading from organism to organism. This is why many viral infections cause us to leak and cough, which is all the better for the virus to spread. If the virus infects cells in your nose, it'll spread through contact with mucus and snot, which can be spread through sneezing. If the virus infects your blood cells, then contact with blood risks a new infection. If the virus is respiratory, it's likely spread through sneezing or coughing, or contact with saliva or esophageal mucus. It's kind of terrifying when you step back and look at viruses as a whole. They're these extremely small packets of biomolecules that have been shaped by billions of years of evolutionary combat against a multitude of defensive chemicals and sophisticated immune systems. And against all the odds, these little infection packets are able to hijack a cell, a chemical structure that's orders of magnitude larger and more complex than itself and exploit it until, perhaps, the cell is forced to suicide in a violent explosion of new viruses. This happens with such regularity that millions of cells can get infected, and the entire organism begins to suffer. Polio is a virus, as is HIV, influenza, and Ebola. All of these viral infections cause diseases in millions of people every year, leading to tens and hundreds of thousands of deaths, mostly in poor, rural areas with little to no access to vaccines or reliable health care. Because viruses can alter the behavior of their hosts, and perhaps even kill their host, viruses have a strong evolutionary influence on the species that they infect. One of the reasons their hosts often have these sophisticated immune systems in the first place is partly because of viral infections over thousands and thousands and thousands of generations. Viruses evolve some method of invasion or deception, and the host's immune system shortly thereafter evolves some kind of new defense, and so on and so forth throughout eons of time in what's known as an evolutionary arms race. When I refer to life as a tide of carbon that's perpetuating itself through time, it should be said further that this life interacts with itself in physical space, engaging in direct and indirect relationships that cause overlap in the currents in the tide. To prolong their lifespan, some animal viruses have evolved the ability to halt the part of their life cycle involved in active replication. The virus can then hide itself through some method, including going so far as to incorporate its viral DNA directly into the host DNA and be perpetuated through evolutionary time by being perpetuated in its host. All humans, including you and me, include some viral DNA in our genome, and this is an artifact to our ancestors having been infected by viruses over and over and over again. The evolutionary arms race is perpetual. 
ongoing through billions of years into the present moment, operating as evolution does on its timescales of tens and hundreds of thousands of years. Some viruses are unable to infect humans, and many of those that can infect humans aren't necessarily fatal. For example, chickenpox is a virus that is relatively harmless in children, responsible for little more than a temporary rash of itchy red spots. Contagious, yes. Annoying and really itchy, yes. Prone to infection if repeatedly scratched, yes. But not fatal. Well, it's not fatal in children. If someone never got chickenpox as a child, or if they never got vaccinated, they never would have developed an immunity to it. Contracting chickenpox as an adult is much more dangerous, as it can progress into shingles and pose a lethal risk. There's also retroviruses like simian foamy virus, or the SFV, which is present in most primates born in captivity, but is associated with no obvious symptoms, despite its kind of terrifying name. The simian foamy virus may not cause any visible symptoms of infection, but it has to be doing something internally, like suppressing the host's immune system, because it makes the infected primate much more vulnerable to other parasites. HIV is also a retrovirus, as is feline leukemia, which can affect litters or populations of domesticated cats. Pox viruses include such diseases as cowpox and smallpox, and there's other more exotic pox diseases like cowpox, monkeypox, and yabba monkey tumor virus. In the case of yabba monkey tumor virus, the infection causes the formation of large tumors across the monkey's body. Interestingly, these tumors aren't permanent, and two to three months after infection, the virus has passed along and the tumors will begin to recede and disappear. The orthomyxoviruses are a very diverse group, and they can infect several species of fish, arthropod, bird, and mammal. For example, bird flu, or avian influenza, is one such virus. It belongs to a genus called Influenza virus A. The orthomyxoviruses are responsible for pretty much all of the viral pandemics in human history. The Spanish flu that hit the world right after World War I was an orthomyxovirus. Various strains of bird flu have infected humans, like the notorious virus strain H7N9, which caused a lot of fear and uncertainty in China in 2013, right when it was first documented and starting to spread. Now the last thing that I want to talk about is what it means for viruses to be on the edge of life why viruses are technically considered to be non-living things instead of living things. Because you might reasonably think, you know, why wouldn't they be living? They, they do all this stuff. They're composed of biomolecules and proteins. They have RNA or DNA. And yeah, maybe they have to hijack a host cell, but they get that DNA replicated. Uh, it replicates themselves and they spread. Like, isn't that life? The reason that scientists consider viruses to be non-living things is because they behave like biomolecules. They behave in a purely chemical fashion. They're essentially non-living chemical complexes. What this means is that these chemical elements will react with stuff if they can. If they can react with stuff, they will. They will undergo physical, non-voluntary processes. Like, the, the viral particles can't come across a receptor that they bind to, and if they're in a perfect orientation to bind to it, they can't say, no, I don't want to, and choose not to. They're, they're chemical structures, and so if they, if they can bind, they will. This is unlike a life form which isn't necessarily so bound to chemical laws. A good example would be a tiger, which is a carnivore that hunts and pounces on its prey. But before the tiger can pounce on its prey, it has to stalk it for some period of time. It has to see what it's doing, and see if it can gauge if it's aware of the tiger, and to what degree it's aware of its surroundings. The tiger has this sensory input of its environment that it's using to calculate and make choices, and this influences its behavior and whether or not it will pounce, and if it will pounce, how it will pounce, how it will go about doing that. And this, this nature, this sensory awareness determining behavior, exists in all life going down to the simplest of cells. 
Although, when you are looking at these single cells and how they behave in their microbial environments, they are strongly influenced by exposure to various chemicals, like hormones, or pheromones, or a pollutant, or some other kind of chemical signal in the medium. But the key point is that when you scale all the way down to the virus, it's purely a chemical complex that is the virus, and because of that, it's not any more alive than a single enzyme is alive, or a plasma membrane is alive. None of those things by themselves are alive. Even if you were to isolate a protein complex involved in some kind of metabolic pathway, it itself, in isolation, is not alive. It's part of a greater living thing, but it itself is not alive. And in much the same way, viruses are not alive. Alright, that is all that I have for you about viruses. This was a pretty fun episode to study for and to write, and I hope you enjoyed listening to it, even though viruses are a somewhat grim subject. When you hear about how viruses cause global suffering and the death of millions, it can be a little challenging to stay upbeat. I hope you got a kick out of this episode. I hope you enjoyed this playlist on the diversity of life in general. Give this episode a like, subscribe to my channel if you like the content, and as always, thanks for listening.